everybody. Welcome back to PWR Nature News. My name is Renee, and behind the camera today, we have Mike, our director here at the Fog Wildlife Refuge. So everybody at home say, hi, Mike. <laughs> Hello. So today, we are going to talk to you about a really amazing topic of snakes. So here at the refuge, we actually have four different captive snakes. So we're going to meet two of those guys today and talk a little bit about them. But first, I want to start off by talking about the category that snakes are in. So snakes are reptiles. They're often confused with amphibians, and many scientists called herpetologists actually study reptiles and amphibians together. So we'll go over the characteristics that make them particularly a reptile. So on a snake's body, they have scales or bony plates, or sometimes a combination between the two. So that is one character. They're also what we call vertebrates. So that means that they have a long backbone, and we're going to get to see that a little bit later as a skeleton down here for you all. And then they are air breathing, so they lack gills. Um, that is where they differ a lot from amphibians as well. And they lay eggs, but actually, what's incredible is not all snakes lay eggs. There's actually 30% of boas and pythons that have live birth, and the rest of the 70% lay eggs. And the reason why those 30% do not lay eggs is mostly because of the colder climates that they live in. It would actually not be good for the eggs. They wouldn't be able to develop. They wouldn't be able to hatch in those colder climates. So instead they've adopted and they actually give live birth. So that's mostly in python, pythons and boa constrictors. So those are just a couple characteristics of reptiles. So the other thing is reptiles are what we call cold-blooded. So they're different than most mammals and birds. So cold-blooded means that their temperature actually relies on their environment. So if it's cold outside, they're cold. If it's hot outside, they're hot. So they can't, they don't have fur and feathers for insulation like some of the other animals you got to meet. Um, so they can't keep warm. So they'll have to find a warm spot on colder days. And they can't sweat. They don't have sweat glands. So they can't cool down. So they find cooler spots on warmer days. So their temperature relies on their environment. That's not the only thing that relies on temperatures with reptiles though. Reptiles that do lay eggs, like most of the snakes, they, their eggs are actually temperature dependent. The sex of their animals, so whether they're male or female, they're young, it's actually dependent on the temperature that the eggs were incubated, which is really cool. So on um, higher temperatures, if these eggs are incubating in the ground at higher temperatures, most of the young are going to be female, and the lower temperatures are mostly male, which is pretty incredible. And that goes for a lot of different reptiles and then some other species of animals as well. So I want to talk to you a little bit about now some of the largest snakes in the world and some of the smallest snakes in the world. But do you guys know how to measure a snake? In inches, because they don't have feet. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, our jokes are not that great, I know. But you can measure a snake, and the largest species of snake you might recognize is actually, some people might say it's an anaconda, but it's actually a reticulated python, and they grow about 30 feet long. So the reason why the anaconda's not the largest is it's not the longest, but it is the heaviest. Green anacondas can grow about 515 pounds and be just about the length of a school bus. But reticulated pythons, even though they're smaller, even though they're skinnier, they are much longer. So they are the largest species of snake. The smallest species of snake is called a thread snake, and they are about 3.9 inches in length. So very, very small snake. And a thread snake kind of makes sense with their name. The largest snake ever existed about 60 million years ago, and that is the Titanoboa. So Titanoboa is actually grew about 60 or 50 feet in length. That's enormous. Could you imagine running into a 50 foot snake? <laughs> one too. Um, but snakes have existed for about 315 million years. They were the most dominant animal during the Mesozoic period. So they've existed for quite a long time. And some of the snakes you can see, um, and that you'll meet one of them today, is more of an old world snake. So it's been around for a very, very long time. So there are um, about 3,000 species of snakes 
in the world, and about 600 of them are venomous species. So we here at the Frog Wildlife Refuge have animals, our snakes are non-venomous, they are actually what we call constrictors. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll meet our first snake. Board, right especially up there at top you can see the white and the black markings just like a checkerboard so checkers is called a corn snake and corn snakes are given that name mostly because their bellies kind of resemble maize or Indian corn um, and that's helpful to them as animals to camouflage so these guys are native mostly they're most common to the southern United States the southeastern United States, like Florida. But these guys are actually as far north as southern New Jersey. Um, and they're common snakes around, around this part of the world. They are also, there's introduced populations on some of the Caribbean islands. So these guys have adapted um, and, and been introduced in other locations. So corn snakes, like their name suggests, can sometimes be found in agricultural fields, like corn fields. Um, but they're also found in some, some woodlands and forest habitats. Um, they're pretty well-adapted species. So this is a constrictor, which means when he consumes his prey, he squeezes his prey, and then he swallows his prey. There are um, uh, instances where corn snakes have been known to swallow their prey live as well, though. So mostly they'll constrict their prey when they consume it. So corn snakes are a common species of snake as a pet. Checkers actually came to us as a pet. Um, when he was very small, he came to us in 1996. So he is about 23 years old, Checkers. Um, he was born, we estimate, in August of 1996. So if you actually, I don't know if you can see up close, he is just, he has a couple patches of, of scales. That's another characteristic of reptile they shed their outer layer of skin. So he just has one tiny patch that he hasn't shed off yet. You can see it right there. I don't know if you can see it on camera. So Checkers came to us because his owner could not keep him as a pet and could not care for him properly. And that happens a lot of the time with our animals. We have other snakes that have come to us for that reason as well, one that you'll meet in just a few minutes. But a lot of the reason why these snakes come to us is because of what they eat. A lot of the owners don't want to feed them what they need to eat in order to survive. Corn snakes are big rodent eaters, so they eat lots of mites. Um, that's a big part of their diet that we feed them here. Um, smaller snakes, when they're younger, they'll sometimes eat lots of frogs, sometimes large insects, but as they get larger, they eat mostly mostly rodents, sometimes some smaller rats, and they can even eat bats and birds. So corn snakes consume lots of different prey. Here at the refuge, we feed him mice. Um, and it's really amazing when our snakes feed because snakes are, are really adapted predators. So we'll talk about some of their senses. So in order to find his food, Checkers does have eyes, and the eyesight of a snake really depends on the species of a snake. So some snakes have really great eyesight, some snakes have really poor eyesight. So it depends on how they're hunting. Corn snakes are called diurnal, and we talked about that a little bit in another segment. Diurnal means that they are active during the daytime, daytime active. So diurnal animals, um, some of them, like checkers, probably has pretty good eyesight. He has cones and rods in, our, uh, in his eyes, just like our eyes. Um, and some snakes have actually really great depth perception as well. I don't know about corn snakes in particular, but corn snakes will use their eyesight a bit to hunt. The other thing is you can see checkers flicking that forked tongue. And what is he doing when he flicks that forked tongue? Well, checkers is smelling with his tongue. A little bit different than how you and I smell, right? So checkers, he will flick his highly sensitive tongue up in the air and he's bringing air through his mouth up to an 
organ at the base of his oral cavity or the roof of his oral cavity towards the back. And that is called the Jacobson organ or the Vermo, this is a really hard word to say, Vermo nasal organ. <laughs> Much easier to say Jacobson organ, right? And that's an organ that can sense smell. So Piggy smells with his tongue. Isn't that incredible? So he can sense his prey that way. The other thing is, if you look at a snake, this is where they differ from legless lizards, is snakes lack ear holes. So you probably saw that as Mike zoomed in a little bit for us. He has no outer ear. He doesn't have an eardrum either, but he does have ear bones inside of his skull, but those bones work differently than ours. So what they do is as he's laying along the ground, those bones can sense lower frequency sounds or vibrations. So he can feel vibrations through his ear bone. So that they're very sensitive that way. So that helps them to find some small prey. <laughs> he likes to explore and slither around. Check out checkers. And these guys have that checkerboard pattern. You see that nice and close. Someone is asking, does checkers bite? He's been handled all his life and he's not harmed by people. He's cared for by people. He's, we treat him with respect. He has no reason to harm us or to bite us. So we always make sure we're careful when handling checkers. We're not hurting him, harming him, um, and, and making him feel threatened or vulnerable. And then he has no reason to bite us. Corn snakes are really docile species too, which is why they're a very common species of pet snake. So that means that they're, they're very calm by nature. And you can see that with checkers. That's a great question though. A lot of people also think that snakes are slimy. Checkers is not slimy at all. He's very dry actually. So his scales are really dry, smooth and shiny. That's kind of why what gives them that slimy look is the reflection of their scales. And they do shed that outer layer of scales. And when they shed, I'll rest checkers down a little here. He does like to slither around. It looks like this. So you can probably hear in the camera a little bit, kind of plastic-like. So I do have a bunch of different skins on the table. This one you can notice lacks a lot of color and pigmentation. This is the shed, this one right here. So this is the thin layer of skin that sheds off. What's also really cool is these guys have what's called a brill on their eyes, which is actually a layer of skin, thin layer, a clear layer of skin over his eyes he sheds off when he sheds as well. I don't know if we can, I think we have the head on this. There we go. I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but he does have the eye scale right on that shed. There's the mouth right here. So the shed lacks color. It's very paper-like, very thin. These right here are actually skins that have been donated to us here at the refuge. Checkers likes to find any place to hide and twist around and he gets himself in some interesting spots. Corn snakes are actually really known to be, um, to be able to get out of their little Houdinis. They can get out of their enclosures very easily. So you have to make sure you have very good clasps on your enclosure. Make sure they're nice and tightly sealed or they'll figure a way to get out. Checkers sometimes when we're handling him, he'll try to go up our sleeves or in our pockets. He loves if we're wearing a little pouch pocket, he'll hide in there like a little cave. <laughs> All right, so I think I'll, we'll meet our next snake friend. Say bye, checkers. So we have, uh, there was a four-year-old who was asking, do snakes get their food with their eyes or nose? Oh. So do they? Smell to hunt. This guy is different though. This is 
called a ball python. Sometimes they're called royal pythons because it's rumored that Cleopatra actually wore one of these on her arm. So they're called ball pythons because when they are threatened or they feel nervous or threatened, they'll roll up in a tight ball and they'll hide their head in the center of that ball and it protects them from predators. Their main predator, most of the snake's main predator are actually raptors or birds of prey. That's primarily who will feed on them, but sometimes other snakes feed on each other as well. Now, ball pythons are a little bit different than checkers in the way that they find their food. So I don't know if you can get up close to his mouth right now for me, Mike, but he has pits near his nose. You might have heard of a venomous snake called a pit viper. They have these really large pits, but ball pythons have smaller ones on his nose or on their noses or their, the front of their mouths, their snouts. And those pits are actually heat sensing pits. So that's primarily how he uses or how he finds his prey. So they actually see in infrared vision. They have like superhero powers, right? So they can see heat, they have heat vision. So different things, depending on the temperature, will show a different color to them. And how that works is inside of their pits, they have two chambers. And one of those chambers is the temperature of his body. And the other chamber is the temperature of the area right outside of him. <laughs> He's coming up towards the camera. So if he is close to something warm, he will sense that slight change between the two chambers and know that there is something live in the area. So it's really amazing, they can sense things a small temperature change up to 0 0.002 degrees Celsius. So the slightest temperature change they can, they can sense. So these guys hunt a lot using their infrared vision. So they're a different, uh, they hunt a little bit differently. And so these guys come from Africa and in the areas that they are, it can get extremely hot. It can get into the hundreds on most days. So they usually are adjacent to areas where there is water so that they can soak and cool off. That's actually, I just got this guy out of his water bath. He likes to soak up the water a lot. And sometimes he'll do that when he's beginning to shed. But usually you can see they're shedding because their bellies will be a little bit pink in color. They will get a, a kind of glazed over look on their eyes and it will become cloudy on their eyes. So you can see his eyes are nice and clear right now. So he's not ready to shed yet. But in those areas where it's so hot, they actually kind of adjust their activity to depend on when they, when they can be active um, and when it's best for them. So these guys are what we mostly call crepuscular. And that means that they're active mainly at dawn and dusk. So that could be part of the reason why they hunt a little bit differently. And they rely on heat sensing and smell instead of just purely their regular eyesight. So the bottom of these guys is a little bit different than checkers, but you can see they have these longer kind of scales at the bottom. So just like a turtle shell, those scales are called scoots. So those bottom scales are called scoots, like a turtle. And kind of, if you look at the pattern of these guys, doesn't it kind of look like, like eyes? That could help them camouflage, but also to confuse predators. It looks like they've always got their eyes on them. So that's helpful as an animal that could also be prey because it will confuse other predators, right? So these are a really stocky species of snake. So he is full grown. Females of this species grow a little bit larger than the males. We have a female. This guy's name is Monty. Our female's name is Blondie. She's a little bit lighter in color. Um, so he is full grown for his size. He came to us because his owner was not comfortable feeding him. And he came to us with Blondie. So they've lived together. These guys, ball pythons, live well together. They'll actually curl up in the same little hideaways together. Um, so Monty is full length. Females get reach about four feet in length, three to four feet in length. Um, but they're stocky species of snake. Kind of like how the anaconda differs from the reticulated python, right? Their anacondas are much wider in girth. Very, very unique, right? So I want to talk to you a little bit more.
more about anatomy of these snakes. So I also will let this guy kind of hang out a little bit and make sure he doesn't slither off our table. But I want to bring up a snake skeleton. <laughs> He's exploring around. So here is a skeleton of a snake. So a lot of people think because of how they move and bend and twist that they don't have bones, but they in fact do. They have a lot of bones in their body. So snakes have a really long backbone filled with lots of vertebrae, right? Because they are <laughs> a vertebrae He's showing you. <laughs> and then what's really kind of strange and cool is attached to every vertebrae, they have a rib with the exception of the tail vertebrae. So you can see that the tails lack ribs. He's a little broken on this one. But every other vertebrae has a rib. So they can have anywhere between 130 and 500 vertebrae, and they have two ribs on each one of those vertebrae. The other thing that they have is a skull. So these guys, because they're constrictors, they do not have fangs, but in their skull, they do have teeth. They have hundreds of teeth that are actually curved backwards in their mouth. So snakes are really well adapted to be able to consume their food without using arms or legs, right? Which I don't know if any of you have ever tried it at home, but I'm sure it's very tricky. <laughs> but they have to consume their food by just manipulating it down their mouths and down their bodies. So what they do is they have a jaw that is hinged so they're able to open their jaw very, very wide. In fact, if you were like a snake, you could actually open your mouth all the way down to your belly button. So you could swallow a whole watermelon if you wanted to. These guys swallow really large prey, sometimes prey up to three times the size of their head. So these guys swallow large, large prey. Um, they have really elastic or stretchy ligaments in their mouths. Their jaw bones are located to the back. So kind of picture if your mouth actually started all the way back here, how much wider you could open your mouth. So they can open it a lot further. The other thing that helps them to manipulate their food is their jaw is not connected on the bottom jaw in the center. So they can kind of wiggle and they have a double hinge here. So they can wiggle and manipulate and walk the food down through their mouths and having it curved backwards, those teeth, it helps so the prey cannot wiggle out of their mouths. So these guys are well adapted predators, right? And they're very stealthy animals too. Ball pythons are known to hiss a lot and loudly if they feel threatened. You can see he's not doing that right now, right? He doesn't feel threatened at all. He's nice and comfortable with being handled. So I think right now we're gonna open it up to some questions. So does anybody have any questions about any of the animals that you've met today or any anatomy or questions about our reptiles? Yeah, so while we're waiting for questions, we also have a really cool specimen up here at the refuge. We have right above our big beautiful windows, we have a long giant skin. What do you think that could be? It's actually a yellow anaconda skin. So that's the whole skin of that anaconda. You can get a picture of how large they are, right? So this skin actually washed up on the beach. So it was thought to have been hung as a decoration in someone's home. And that's actually something interesting to point out about these animals, especially ball pythons are hunted a lot for their skin, their beautiful skin, and they're also taken out of the wild a lot for the exotic pet trade. Um, and their populations where they exist in the wild are actually threatened. But snakes have an important ecological role. These guys eat lots of rodents and, and animals that can be nuisance animals, especially to farmers, right? So these guys are helpful at keeping rodents away, especially corn snakes. So Kimberly is asking, what is the most common snake on Long Island? Oh, that's a tough one. We have a lot of garter snakes on Long Island. I would say they're, they're most common snakes. Um, we have a couple different species of snakes on Long Island. 
Long Island, none of the snakes that we have here are venomous, at least anymore. All of our venomous snakes were extirpated or pushed out or hunted to extinction on Long Island. The garter snake is our, I would say, is our most common snake here. We also have black racers. We have northern water snakes, eastern hognose snakes, uh, ringneck snakes. So we have a couple different species here on Long Island, all non-venomous. And where does the corn snake originate from? Oh, so they are most common in Florida and the southeastern United States, but they can be found as far north as southern New Jersey. But, and then there's populations now on some of the Caribbean islands that were introduced. So that is the problem with some snake species. People get them as pets and they release them out into the wild. Some of them will not survive in the habitats that they're being introduced. Some of them will actually survive a little too well where they'll outcompete native wildlife. Like um, the problems with Burmese and reticulate pythons in the Everglades. Any other questions, Mike? Uh, I think, and, and what about the ball python? What does he? They are from that? Africa, Western Africa, Central and Western Africa. And they live in very hot, dry areas, but they live adjacent to areas where there's um, some sort of body of water so they can, they can soak because it gets so hot where they are. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to actually, we had a lot of friends ask us to have a craft that they could do about our last topic or topic of worms. So we actually have a really cool craft that we do a lot of the time in our camps. It's a little snake mobile. And we thought we'd kind of create a, a little fun, friendly fun and see if you all can try to create the best corn snake. So what we did, I don't know if you could see it that well here, but is if you take a paper plate, you can make a snake-like pattern and then you color it and cut it out and attach a string. This string looks just like his tongue, right? And it creates this really cool mobile. So what we'll do is we're going to post the craft in our face on our Facebook page, but we'll also send it to you in an email. So we really urge you all to become members of the refuge support animals like Monty and Checkers. Um, but you'll also receive all of our emails in the mail, so it's a good way to stay informed, right? And so we'll send it out in an email as well on how to do this craft. Any other questions, Mike? Uh, just, uh, Stacy is asking, are we open at this time? So our trails are open still outside and you can view our outdoor animals. They're open from dawn till dusk. We are asking people that they actually just walk them in one direction. So we have signs for that at the refuge. All of our other facilities are closed right now. So our outdoor bathrooms, our greenhouse, um, and our nature center is closed at this time. But you can come and from a distance, nice safely explore our, our, our trails still. Well, we hope you guys tune in on next Tuesday for our other nature news, and we're going to have another live critter for you. And otherwise, everybody stay safe and have a good day. Say bye.